Ryan Gilbert got out of his executive car and tossed the driver Michael. Go have lunch, I have an important meeting here. Sashka nodded and the car started off. Mr. Gilbert leisurely entered the lobby of the enormous hotel complex, whose board of directors he served on. The man liked to walk slowly around the premises of the complex, looking around the magnificent modern interior of the hotel with a master's eye. He liked to dine in the hotel restaurant. The design of the restaurant stood in stark contrast to that of the entire complex. There was no abundance of glass and plastic. On the contrary, the restaurant was the exact opposite of the lobby. Subdued soft light, lovely pictures on the walls, wooden partitions which gave the feeling of being hidden from prying eyes. There were beautiful tablecloths on round tables, chairs on curved legs, and a sense of warmth and familiarity about the place. The atmosphere inspired peace and trust. Ryan planned to hold here today a friendly meeting with investors and to conclude some serious contracts in a quiet atmosphere. The cozy restaurant suited to this purpose as well as possible. Ryan nodded hello to the barman, who made a serious face as he recognized one of the guests. The guests were already pulling up to a separate booth, and soon the negotiations began at the table. Ryan, for as long as he could remember, had always gotten everything he wanted. He finished school with a gold medal and graduated with honors from college. After a short time of working for his uncle, he saved up enough money to start his own business. He had to sweat in a sense, but soon his business took off and began to bring in a steady income. Over time, the man expanded his enterprise. Now the successful businessman was only taking profits, but this seemed to him not enough. His active nature did not want to rest, and Ryan began to buy shares in enterprises that seemed to him quite promising, such as this very hotel complex. And everything was successful and smooth. Only one thing upset the man, he could not create a family. He saw every potential contender for a wife, first of all as a huntress for his money. To him all the girls were sharks, wanting only his money, his position, and his power. Once he fell in love with a simple sweet girl, fell in love with all his heart. But just before the wedding he decided to test the fidelity of his bride. And the girl did not pass the test, completely failing it. Ryan then hired a fitness trainer to woo his fiancée. And now the words of the nice girl recorded on the phone were still in my ears. You just be patient, my love, I will marry Ryan, and then everything will be fine. He has so much money that you and I have enough and our children will be left. Since then, Ryan has used the services of the female sex only on a want it, pay it, say goodbye type of service. For events where a chaperone was needed, he simply booked an expensive girl from the escort service. They were the ones the man thought were honest. They didn't act like innocent sheep, they made money with it, and they didn't hide it. As is always the case in his life, the negotiations with the investor ended successfully. Mr. Gilbert said goodbye to his guests, offering them to stay and dine on the house, and himself, feeling a little tired, went to his suite, which was assigned to him for life, like everyone else from the board of directors. Opening the door of the room, the man heard a soft singing through the humming of the vacuum cleaner and wondered who it was that needed to clean his suite at night. There must be perfect order here at all times of day and night, a young girl was vacuuming the room and quietly drinking under her breath. Suddenly Ryan was gazing at her. She was tall, almost as tall as him, in a short maid's uniform, limber, with a thick black braid thrown over her shoulder and a clean, pinkish face. Everything about this maid breathed with youth and freshness. The man silently approached the girl from behind and embraced her. The maid cried out in fright and turned around. Mr. Gilbert, did you scare me? Relieved, she sighed. Who are you, child? The businessman asked without unclasping his hands. The new girl, why are you cleaning your room so late? The girl broke free from his embrace and spoke quickly. Forgive me, Mr. Gilbert. I didn't expect your negotiations to end so early. I was hoping to make it in time. Why didn't you clean up with the afternoon? The girl blushed. My mother was sick. I was afraid to go away and run to the drugstore and home. Don't you worry, I've already put everything in order. Ryan gazed intently into the maid's face and could not understand what was happening to him. What was it about this young woman that endlessly attracted him? There was something in her that made the man feel strange uneasiness 
and the feeling that once they had met, but the information of the meeting, his brain refused to give. It was a holdover of sorts. You're not going to complain about me, are you? I ingratiate myself and now the girl asked. What's your name, child? Mary. Well, Mary, no one will find out about anything, but you can make a decent living by the way. Stay with me tonight. You'll get as much money as you won't vacuum in a month. Mr. Gilbert grabbed Mary in his arms, threw her on the bed, and piled on top of her. The maid's reaction stunned him. Turning from under him, the cheeky girl smacked him in the face. She jumped up from the bed, flushed and beautiful in her fury. She yelled, shame on you, you're old enough to be my father. Ryan laughed in surprise. So what, or are you trying to tell me you're pure invisible? Even so, not everyone is for sale, and you're not everyone's standard of male beauty. Oh, how you talk, said the man. No, honey, I may not be handsome, but everyone sells out, and you will sell out. Believe me, I always get what I want. The girl's eyes narrowed, and she grabbed the vacuum cleaner and ran out of the room. Ryan rubbed her flushed cheek and laughed softly. What the hell does that Hoover think she's made of? She thinks she'll go unpunished after that slap, moral and physical. The man reached into his phone pocket and dialed the manager's number. Constantine, come as my room. A few minutes later, a frightened manager's invitation entered the room. Unheard of, he was summoned by one of the hosts, and yet, in such a disgruntled tone. Ryan paced the room, nervously sipping from his glass of alcoholic liquid, whiskey before he went to bed. Even more puzzled was the subordinate. Constantine, do you know the entire staff personally? Of course, Mr. Gilbert, the manager answered eagerly. I personally interview everyone. Then tell me about Mary the maid. Ah, Mary, what has that girl done again? She hasn't been on the job a week and she's already got complaints about her from the guests. She insults the customers. She cleans up badly. Mr. Gilbert roughly guessed why she insults or doesn't finish cleaning. She's a pretty darn good one. What do you know about her? Well, she comes from a poor family. Her mother raised her alone, didn't have money for education, so she took a job as a girl as a maid. And I remembered her mother was sick, like with cancer. Good, grinned the businessman. Then they need the money. I'm entrusting you with a delicate task, Constantine. He was quiet for a while, gathering his thoughts. It's not often you have to entrust personal matters to subordinates. You must arrange for Mary to stay with me overnight, or if that makes more sense, be in my bed. Don't stop at the price. Any money. That's it. You're free. I look forward to it. Constantine left the room and went to his office. There he used the internal phone to find Marina and summoned her to his office. The girl entered the manager's office and immediately rushed in. Mr. Smith, it's not my fault. Mr. Gilbert started hitting on me. So I punched him in the face. You already complained, haven't you? The manager was horrified. In the face? The owner? What have you done, you fool? Ours is going to re-corner the hell out of everyone right now. You don't work here anymore. Change your clothes and get out of the hotel. And don't you dare come within a mile of this place. Marina cried and looked pleadingly at the manager. Don't fire me, Mr. Smith. I can't be out of work. My mother needs expensive medicine. I can't make that much money at another job. Have pity on me. Would you like me to ask my master for forgiveness? The girl was already sobbing at the top of her voice. Done. Satisfied Constantine realized but decided to push the proud girl. There is one way out. Only first, I want to explain to you the possible consequences of your antics. First of all, Mr. Gilbert has the whole city in his fist. You'll never get a job anywhere. How are you going to treat your mother? What are you going to eat? And if your boss wants to, he can make your life unbearable. On the other hand, if you behave correctly, you can hit the jackpot. Even his mother will be able to heal. It's up to you. And the manager of the game on the indifferent, perhaps, shrugged and turned away, tensely waiting for the girl's answer. Mary wiped away her tears and asked quite calmly already, and what am I supposed to do? Relieved to catch his breath, Constantine took her hand. You just go up to him and stay the night, just for one night. 
As a rule, Mr. Gilbert doesn't continue a relationship with anyone else. All right, Mary replied blankly. I'll go to him. She snatched her hand away, turned and went. Without knocking, opening the door of the master suite, Mary walked into the living room and sat down in a chair, defiantly putting her foot down. Ryan laughed smugly. Well, it hasn't even been an hour. Was a few hours worth the trouble of dragging out the pleasure? I know how to give pleasure. Take my word for it. Will you have some champagne? I will, Mary nodded. For courage. All right then. The man pulled a bottle of champagne from the ice bucket, opened it with a quiet pop, and poured it into flutes. Holding out one flute to Mary, he said with a smile. Why for courage then? Haven't you really had any experience of intimacy? Freshly told tales are hard to trust. Well, why not? I've had experience. Mary defiantly took a volley of champagne and stood up. It's just the first time in my life I've ever been forced into bed with my own father. The flute slipped from Ryan's hands and shattered with a deafening clink. What did you say? Say it again. What did daddy hear? What didn't your heart feel? Didn't feel your own blood? Sit down, said the man stiffly. Don't try to trick me. That trick won't work on me. Admit it, you made up an excuse not to sleep with me. Mary sat back in her chair and calmly replied. Do you remember your prom night in high school? Catherine, remember. Suddenly, Mr. Gilbert's legs trembled, and he collapsed into the chair like a bite. Before his eyes flashed, like a silent movie, episodes of his school life. Here he was sitting at the desk with a beautiful black-haired girl. Here he is asking his deskmate modest Catherine on a date. Here on prom night in love, Catherine passionately responds to his kisses. Only he was on prom night completely drunk. He and his classmates got drunk for the first time in celebration of freedom and entry into a new adult life. And then Mr. Gilbert left his town, went to college, and forgot all about his prom and the tender, inept caresses of his first woman. Catherine. Remembered? Mary asked, quietly. I never would have admitted it if you hadn't started it. Mother forbade it. She's very proud of me. Even in death, though she still loves you, seen her staring longingly at school pictures. Mr. Gilbert clutched his head from his clenched teeth. Suddenly, it was as if consciousness had opened up. He realized what he had to do. It was plain and simple. More confident than ever in his decision, he rose sharply, grabbed Mary's hand and ordered. Change your clothes at once, we're going to your mother's. When the driver stopped the car in front of the ramshackle, ramshackle house, Ryan and Mary got out of the car and entered the house. A nightlight burned in the only larger room, and the man's heart ached. The place was deserted. There was little in the way of furniture. An old round table, a couch with one chair, a bed with a nightlight on it, and a pile of medicine. And on the bed lay a haggard, sickly woman, her hair slightly touched with gray, luxurious black. Catherine, whispered Ryan. The woman flinched frightened and looked up, the man's daughter insisting in front of her. Ryan, are you? From where? Mary, why? I head to mom, sorry. Mary helped her mother out of bed. Ryan crouched beside her on the bed and hugged the woman. I'm sorry, Catherine. I didn't know you were sick. For everything, I'm sorry, dear. The glitter of riches completely clouded my mind. I had forgotten everything. I forgot our love, young fool. But you're not alone now. I'll arrange everything. You and your daughter won't have to go through any more trouble. And you will soon be on your feet, I swear to you. Catherine quietly pressed herself against his chest and cried. Only it was not clear from grief, relief, or from the realization that to her returned the man she had loved all her life. A week later John flew with Catherine to Germany, where he paid for his beloved surgery. And after a while Cat really went on the mend and got back on her feet. No longer was the man alone. He had a very real family, a wife and a daughter. A beautiful and smart daughter and a devoted and loving wife who had waited for him through the years and whom he had snatched from the clutches of death. Thank you for your attention and see you again.